Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for our next edition of our 49er industry chat. I am going to pause for a second as we welcome our attendees in today. Thank you for joining us. My name is Noemi Nevada. I'm the Director of Alumni Engagement here at California State University, Long Beach. Thank you for joining us for our next edition of our 49er industry chat. Before we get started, um, just want to Remind you, this session is being recorded and it will live on our website at csuob.edu forward slash alumni. Also, I encourage you to submit any questions for our guest speaker today um, in the Q&A box located above or below your screen throughout our chat today. And now it's my honor to introduce Dr. Mike Munoz, President, Superintendent President of Long Beach City College. Dr. Mike Munoz is nationally recognized as a transformational leader in higher education, an expert in closing racial equity gaps for students of color and creating inclusive campus cultures for LGBTQIA students. He joined LBCC in 2018 as the Vice President of Student Services, providing executive leadership for various programs and student-facing support services for the more than 30,000 students at LBCC. Dr. Munoz has extensive experience teaching in counseling and higher education. He was recognized as an outstanding faculty member in 2019 by USC's Rosier Student Organization and as a 2018 Dr. Cynthia S. Johnson awardee by CSULB for his contributions to higher education through exceptional student mentoring Dr. Munoz serves on the board of directors for the National Community Colleges Hispanic Council as a founding board member of Colegas, the California Community College Latinx Professional Association, and as a member of the Associate Degree for Transfer Intersegmental Implementation Committee. Hosting today's industry chat, please help me welcome Dr. Mike Munoz. Thank you, Dr. Munoz, for joining us today. Thank you, Noemi, for having me. I'm excited to we're, be here. We're very excited to chat with you and to get to know a little bit about, about your path through um, Long Beach and about your, your career um, in higher education. So um, to start off, you know, I'd like to ask that you, know, you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about um, you know, your start in, in community college and then your, your path through um, uh, the four-year institution, and then we, we go from there. Sure, awesome. So I'll kind of kick off by talking a little bit about my own educational journey. So I'm a product of the community college system. I attended both East Los Angeles College and Fullerton College um, as a community college student. When I was a community college student, you know, I was what you would call, you know, post-traditional. I was working full-time. I was raising a daughter. Um, I was dealing with, at different moments in time, with housing and food insecurities. I was also dealing with coming out um, as, a, as a gay young man. And so there was a lot of things happening at once for me in the community college system. And so I was very fortunate that I had this counselor who took a very strong interest in me um, as, when I was a student. And I always say, you know, he changed my life. He um, connected me with resources. So I got involved in programs like EOPNS, got involved in Alpha Gamma Sigma. I participated in a Northern California University tour during spring break. I did the Summer Scholars Transfer Institute where I lived in the dorms at UC Irvine. And so many of those transformative experiences were really key because as a first-generation college student, as a student who, like I said, as a, as a student parent, um, I did not think that certain things were within reach. And he helped show me in those programs that were really transformational, helped show me that, you know, transferring to a school like UC Irvine was within reach. And so I ended up transferring to UC Irvine. I lived in family housing with my daughter she attended the Child Development Center on campus. And so that was what I say, you know, was one of the first times my life in many years had stabilized. Um, prior to moving into um, student housing at UC Irvine, I had moved very frequently. I had unstable housing. So it felt really good to know that I would have, as silly as it sounds, electricity and running water without having to worry with it being shut off or, you know, just even having access to um, the internet. Because at the time, this was the late 90s and only you know, wealthy people had the internet at the time. So it was, you know, very, I think, um, an important pivotal moment for me when I transferred. And then, you know, from there, 
you know, while I was a student at UC Irvine, I was, I majored in psychology and social behavior. And I still was a little unclear. Initially, I was thinking I was going to go to law school. And so I was kind of also taking some, a lot of criminology, law and society courses. And I was working really hard towards applying to law school because I always say, you know, we oftentimes aspire to what we know. And my, my knowledge around different careers were, were limited. So it was like, mm-hmm. you'd be a doctor, you'd be a lawyer, you'd be a firefighter. You know, it was these kind of like careers that most students recognize and know. So and I picked attorney. But as I started doing research and getting closer um, to graduating, I realized, you know, I didn't think the field of law was for me. Initially, I was like, I'll be a lawyer because I like to argue with people. And that's what I saw on television. As I started doing internships, I realized, oh, no, you're pulling files, you're doing research. I was like, yeah, this isn't, this isn't my vibe. So I did some self-reflection and I really thought about, you know, what do I want to do with my life? And I realized, you know, I want to make, a, I want to have a life of impact. And that was very important to me. And so I thought of the, the relationship that I had with my counselor and the impact he had on me. Um, and not just me, but on my daughter's life as well. Right. And so I realized, you know, hey, you know, this, this is the field for me. And so I was very fortunate. I applied to Cal State Long Beach. Um, to the master's in school counseling program. And as y'all know, it's a very competitive program, our master's in counseling programs at Long Beach State. And so I was fortunate that I was admitted into the program. And then that kind of set me on my path to pursue a career in counseling. And then, um, and so I'll pause there. So that's my educational experience. And then I, I can obviously talk more about my transition into the professional world as well. Right. So I know you worked at Rio Ando for many years. Is was that while you were going to school that you were also, you know, were were more hands on in that um, community college ex- experience as well? Sure. So I have a very interesting career trajectory. Mm-hmm. And so I'm going to take it back a little bit. So all through undergrad, I actually worked at Kaiser Permanente. So my whole community college experience, as well as while I was doing my bachelor's at UC Irvine, I did not work in higher ed. I worked at Kaiser Permanente and it was, it provided me some stability. I had health insurance and, but I, I knew I wanted a break into education. And so I had gotten my bachelor's degree from UC Irvine. And I don't know if I should say this, but I thought I was real like, Real fresa. I thought I was real cool because I got a bachelor's degree from UC Irvine. So I started applying to all these jobs at, at different community colleges and at, at different universities, and I couldn't even get an interview. So I was really frustrated. I was really sad, to be honest with you, because I felt like I did all this work and I couldn't catch a break. Right. And so my former counselor. And I think, but uh, coming like for us to be for for us to be first generation, like. I think that's what we think. Like we have our bachelor's, we're going to get that job because we have the bachelor's, but that's not always the case, you know? Not at all. And I'm glad that you highlighted that because I had set myself up for these expectations that this degree was just going to open all these doors. Right, right. And so I was really frustrated. And so like I had done at different points in my life, I reached out to my counselor and he knew I really wanted to work in the community college system. And he actually, so I was telling him how frustrated I was. So he called me one day. This is, you know, back, you know, before text messages when people actually would pick up the phone and call you. Right? <laughs> so he called me and he said, Mike, there's an um, opportunity here at Santa Ana College. Um, because at the time he, would, he hadn't left Fullerton and moved to Santa Ana College. And he's like, and I can get you, there's a good chance you can get in, but it's a short term position. So it would have no health care, kind of get the job, work in it for a while, and then you apply for the permanent positions, kind of the situation. Mm-hmm. and he's like it's a counseling assistant position it's a clerk in the front desk and then I was like sounds great how much does it pay and it actually paid less than I was making at Kaiser and so I told him I said okay I want to make sure I understand this you want me to leave my job that pays me more with full time that's full time with benefits to take a part time position with no benefits that pays me less is that what you're saying I need to do and he was like yep that's what I'm saying he's like do you want to work in the community college system and I was like, I do. He's like, well, that's probably what it's going to require. Right. And so I took a leap of faith. And I, I, um, I gave my notice at Kaiser. And I took this position at Santa Ana College. And I worked in the short-term position for a few months. And luckily, I was able to get picked up in another position under a TRIO grant. And so that's kind of how I, my, I got my foot in. And so what I tell folks of, about the bachelor's degree is, you know, what it does is it allows you to accelerate through positions if you have this kind of educational credential, but you still have to pay your dues. 
you still have to start in kind of these entry level positions and work your way up. So like I said, I started my career as a clerk in the front desk of the counseling center. And then I worked my way up from there into a trio specialist position working with talent search at a local high school. And then from there, I was able to land a full-time coordinator position working for Gear Up. Um, and then once I finished, and those were the three positions I held while I was working on my master's and my school counseling credential at Long Beach State. When I graduated with my master's degree, I got picked up at Saddleback High School in Santa Ana Unified as a full-time high school counselor. And so I worked at the high school. I left community colleges. I went to work um, for four years at a high school as a high school counselor. At the same time, I also worked adjunct part-time counseling at Santa Ana College. So I would work 7.30 to 3.30 at Saddleback High School as a counselor. And then I would work a four to seven shift two nights a week in the transfer center at Santa Ana College. And so I had my foot in, in both roles, the K-12 and the community college role. Right. And so um, about my third year at Saddleback High School as a counselor, I loved the individual impact I was making on students' lives. I found it very rewarding. But at the same time, I was very frustrated by the system and the structure I was working within. And I felt like I could be doing more. But I realized that if I wanted to do that, I had to move into the world of leadership. So around 2007, Cal State Long Beach announced that they were going to be offering their very first independent educational doctorate. Right. And up until then, it was a joint doc between UC Irvine and Cal State Long Beach. And so I decided to apply for that first cohort and I was successful getting in. And that kind of then was the impetus for me to move towards um, seeking positions in, in educational leadership. Wonderful, thank you for that. And then let's dive in into your, your, your passion about you know, that systemic impact. Do you think, um, I mean, in your role right now, how important it is that you are supporting students, you know, whether it's first gen or housing insecurity, uh, can we talk a little bit about that and your efforts in, 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 in assisting the community in that? Yeah, so for me, I, like I said, I'm very motivated by impact and, and, I, and I'm a systems thinker. I embrace that. Like, I like being a problem solver. I like looking at gaps, right, in our systems and thinking about how do we fix those. Um, and so for me, you know, it goes back to, you know, why am I in the seat, you know? I always say I had, I had a career through happenstance. And what I mean by that is that, you know, I didn't grow up aspiring to be a college president. I actually didn't aspire to be a college president until a few years ago, to be perfectly honest with you. I really wanted to be a vice president and that seemed kind of like my sweet spot. And then in recent years, I got kind of, for without going into all the, the, the um, details, I kind of you know, elevated a little bit faster than maybe I would have thought for myself, but I can go into that in a minute. But for me, it was really about impact, right? And being in a role where I could create impact. So what happened was I was a counselor and I thought, okay, if I could be a counselor, I could then, you know, solve all these issues. And then I was, like I said, I was working with students, but I was frustrated by the system and structure. I saw inequities for our dreamers. I saw inequity for our black students. I saw inequities for, you know, our former foster youth. And so I was just very frustrated. So then I moved into a director role and I was saying, okay, I'll be a director and then I'll be a manager and I'll have a budget to do things. Because for me, when you're a counselor, you don't get a budget, you, you know, to do anything. You just, you, you serve a role. So I was like, okay, I'll have a budget and with a budget, I could do things. And then, you know, I was a director and I was like, no, I had to do what the dean told me to do. And then I became a dean. I was like, okay, I'm a dean now. And now I'm really going to make impact. And then I was just like, nope, because I still have to convince the vice president <laughs> to support some of the strategies or the ideas I have. And then I became a vice president. And I will say at the vice president level, you do have a lot more I think, access to resources and authority to make certain decisions. But even then I was still having to work through a president. And so I think again, now here in this role as superintendent president, I, and as the chief executive officer for, you know, a college as large and as well known as Long Beach City College, you know, I have the unique ability to work with a team to really, like I said, prioritize students who oftentimes are not thought of first when decisions are made. So the very first question I ask myself in any decision I make is how does this decision impact students? And then I ask myself a follow-up question. How does this impact our most vulnerable students? The students that we know are, you know, dealing with systemic racism, they're dealing with 
housing insecurities that are dealing with, you know, um, all the challenges that, you know, I experience and many other students experience, right? And so that's kind of how I make decisions. And, you know, the reality is that these jobs are very challenging. You know, it's a lot of negotiating, a lot of balancing of the wheels. But I think it's really important to bring those perspectives into the room as you're making decisions. Because I think, and this isn't a, a dig at anybody, because I don't think you have to have experienced housing and food insecurity to have deep empathy for our students. Right. But I think what happens sometimes is folks in these positions where these decisions are made, they not have always had these lived experiences. So they're not necessarily at the forefront of their minds why these decisions are being made, right? And so I think that's why diversity matters, not just in terms of race, ethnicity, and gender, but diversity of thought and diversity of experiences as well. And so that's just something that I've you know, reflected on in the last year or so as I've been you know, transitioning into my new role. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that. You know, a question that I do have is like, what sparked that interest in student affairs for you? Um, you know, I don't think a lot of people think about a career in student, mm -hmm. like, what is that? Like, even yeah. for me now, like, how do you explain to your family what that is? Because they don't understand. <laughs> yeah, I don't even know if they still understand. <laughs> right? <laughs> but um, So for me, I think what really sparked my desire to serve in student affairs is just reflecting on my own journey. So this is really cheesy. Um, so, but I'm just gonna say it, you know, when I was reflecting on what I wanna do, one of the questions that came up is, I was like, I wanna be happy. And I know that sounds like very oversimplistic, but I was like, what's gonna make, I asked that self, myself that question. And I was like, what's gonna make me happy? And the work that I do, and I really thought about the relationship I had with my counselor and how at these very difficult moments in my life, he was there to uplift me. He didn't wave a magic wand and fix my problems. Like I had to do the work, but he illuminated a path for me and on a path to a more positive place. And I was like, I want to do that. Like I want to make impact in that way. And so I, oftentimes, I'll be honest with you, I've emulated other people's careers that I've really admired and respected. And so I followed his path. And then when I was a counselor and I was kind of in this, like I was in the master's program in counseling, I had an opportunity. I was doing some field work at Santa Ana College. And at the time there was an associate dean there by the name of Dr. John Hernandez, who's a graduate of Long Beach State as well. Yes, um, distinguished and, alumni. Yes, he is. And you know, I remember I went into his office and, you know, as a first generation professional, I remember I sat down and I saw his doctorate degrees on the wall. And it was the first time I saw a Chicano or actually it's Cubano, but a Latino with a PhD and um, in a role like that. And I remember I sat down in his desk and I said, I want to be you. How do I become you when I, when I grow up? And he kind of like laughed. He thought it was like weird. He was like, who are you? And why are you here? And he was, why are you asking but, me this? Yes, but I was like, I want to be an associate dean. How do I do that? And he was like, well, you got to get your PhD and you got to do this. And, you gotta, and I'm sitting here ferociously taking notes, right? And so that's kind of how I stumbled into student affairs because I saw he was leading these efforts of this, um, because obviously as associate dean, he had student life and all these different things in his portfolio. But one of the things that struck me is um, Santa Ana College has this program called Kinder Caminata, where on Cesar Chavez Day, they bring all the kindergartners onto their college campus and they talk to them about going to college and they instill that and plant that seed in them in kindergarten. And I just remember being like so impressed, again, thinking on a systems level, right? Like every kindergartner in the city comes to this campus and has this experience. And so I just, you know, I think for me, like I said, that's how I got pulled into student services or student affairs is reflecting on my own experience and some of the relationships that I had with student affairs professionals and the impact they had on me personally. And then looking for role models in the field that were really doing the type of work that I saw myself doing one day and then connecting with them and asking them to help guide me. You know, Dr. Hernandez, he didn't get weirded out that I went to his office. I mean, he took a, again, took an interest in me and helped guide my career for the last 20 years. And so I think those are some of the things that I think pulled me into student services. Um, and then lastly, I know this is going to sound silly, but I'm good at it. You know, I think I'm a big believer of leaning into your strengths. And sometimes, you know, we're, and again, don't get me wrong, like I think cultural humility is important to have. But sometimes I think we don't, we're not willing to, to like lean into our own greatness. And we're kind of 
we want to dim our lights a little bit and not, you know, come across like, oh, we're, we're too, you know, self-promoting. But the truth is like, if you're good at something, recognize that and lean into that and feel good about that, acknowledge that. And so I knew I was an effective counselor. I was an effective student affairs professional. And so I really leaned into it. And I think that, um, and I recognized that it was a strength. And so I, I essentially built my whole professional career around my strengths. Right. And I think we're like trained to not be like, I'm not going to like conceited about it, you know, but we are a little bit more reserved in, in, in that way. Um, I know you talk about uh, some of your mentors. Uh, what advice do you have for our students and our young alumni in regards to finding a mentor that they want to emulate in the future? Like, where do they start? Sometimes you are afraid to go to your faculty and, and say, hey, I would want to, you know, can you teach me? Could you guide me? We're sometimes just afraid of asking. So what advice do you have for our students? So I, I, would, I would say that mentorship comes in many different forms. And so there's formal mentorship and there's informal mentorship. Mm -hmm. And so I think one, it, and then also recognizing that um, you can't just have one mentor. Um, mm -hmm. I call it like, I heard someone say this many years ago. I don't remember who but I kind of adopted, it. it's like, you want to create your own board of directors, like your own group, like you want like a pool of people that will mentor you and guide you for different things. Mm -hmm. So, because, you know, not one mentor is going to be able to meet all necessarily your needs or have the time. Right. And so I have a team of mentors that I've over the years reached out to, and some of it's issue specific. Some of it is um, lifestyle specific, you know, I'm unique. I'm an openly gay, Chicano, unapologetically social justice oriented educational leader. I can tell you, I had mentors that would tell me you should stay in the closet. That didn't sit well with me, right? So I knew I couldn't necessarily talk to them about that part of my identity, but these other parts that were really helpful with in terms of me dealing with how to deal with union conflict, <laughs> you know, because mm -hmm. I remember the first time I became in and I got grieved as an administrator and I was like literally crying and I was what is this? And I didn't even, you know, realize I had did something that I, you know, unintentionally in terms of our contract. And so, you know, these are all rookie mistakes that every leader learns. Right. And so, right. so just recognizing that you need different mentors at different moments in time. And so you build that team of support around you, I think is really important. The other thing is um, recognizing that, you know, you, really when you want mentorship, the onus is on you to put yourself out there and, I got a lot of no's over the years, or, you know, I'll get back to you. And I think the person always had really good intentions of wanting to connect because, but remember a lot of these folks in these positions are busy. So you can't take it personal if someone doesn't get back to you or let that discourage you from asking someone else or even circling back with them at another point in time. And so I always say, you know, be willing to put yourself out there, um, Put yourself out there to multiple different types of mentors so that you're looking at the different types of opportunities as well as being um self-reflective like what are you being very self-aware so it's not just like will you be my mentor but it's like specific they ask is like you know i'm really looking for a mentor that can support me in these ways this is how i'm hoping to develop and i admire you because you have these qualities you know and so there's different opportunities like i said to sit down and, and seek that kind of informal and formal mentorship the other thing that i've done that's been really powerful in my career is I participated in a lot of fellowships and leadership development mm -hmm. um, programs apart from like my educational journey. And so, and through those leadership programs that I've done, you oftentimes are paired with mentors or you're in environments with folks that are kind of there to do mentoring. And so you can create some informal relationships. So I think, like I said, it's multi-pronged. Right. And then how important are the professional associations? I know you are part of multiple of them. Mm -hmm. How important is that? And then would you advise our, our students or even our recent grads to, to look into the professional associations as well? I'm a big advocate of professional associations. I think they're very important for multiple reasons. Um, not just from like a building of your social capital and your networking, because I think that's important, but also in terms of staying current with the issues and the literature and the trends that are happening in our field, you know, that's really important. Um, I just returned from a conference a couple of weeks ago from in New York, it was the American Association of Community Colleges. And it was really important for me to see what, what's happening nationally 
And I was able to come back and have some real conversations with our cabinet about, hey, you know, I think we need to really start paying attention to micro credentialing. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't think we're doing enough work in this on this level. I know we're doing some, but I think we could be doing more because this is what I'm seeing in the trends right now. Um, and so especially if what it looks like to re-engage students who stepped away from us as a result of the pandemic, you know, the landscape's changing, right? And so, so professional associations, I think, help keep you current. I think they help you build a professional and so, um, social network, which is important. I think they will increase your likelihood of um, engaging with potential mentors. Because I will say this, sometimes it's important to be mentored by someone outside your organization. Um, I think it's important to have mentors within the organization, but I also think it's important to have mentors outside of the organization you work in. So I, I'm a big advocate of professional associations. And I think, like I said, as there's opportunities to do different fellowships or leadership programs, I know like NASPA um, mm -hmm. is a really good organization. If you're in the community college level, like I said, there's multiple community college associations. If you belong to a certain affinity group or identity group, there's oftentimes identity-based um, professional associations as well. Um, so I think that's, if you look at the types of um, fellow, leadership fellowship programs I've done, as well as different professional associations I'm affiliated with, they intersect with all the different types of my identities. Wonderful. So now transitioning more into your current role as superintendent and president of LBCC, what does your typical day look like? Oh my gosh. Okay. So I kind of laugh at this one because it's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason why I say this is, and I think folks on the line who, you know, pretty much been a student affairs or student services professional will really understand this and relate to this, is in student services or student affairs, our lives, you know, are very complex and we're constantly go, go, go. So, um, but our work oftentimes overlaps. So yes, as vice president, I can deal with an enrollment services issue and then jump to a student conduct issue, or then maybe jump to you know, a, a, a EOPS issue, but it was still kind of in the same umbrella or family of work. When I moved into the superintendent president's role, it's like every two minutes I'm changing gears. You know, I'm going from talking to a set of attorneys regarding legal issues facing, you know, the college is dealing with different lawsuits. And so I'm I, I basically not a day goes by that I'm not on the phone with an attorney at some point. And then I'm switching from that to dealing with a shared governance or a union issue. So then I'm talking to the president of the Senate or the president of the union about an issue there. And then I'm transitioning quickly from that to go give a speech to a group of students, right? And I'm doing like a right. student award. So I got to go in and be very inspirational. And then I'm switching from that and I'm dealing with, I report directly to a board. So I'll, the board member wants to talk to you and there's a concern with one of the board members is bringing forward and I have to manage that. And then I'm switching from that to, oh, well, we got a, you know, $1.2 billion construction bond program. And so there's this issue with this construction project and we got to make this decision. And so I got to then change gears and focus on this construction project, right? Because this decision is timely and it needs to be made. And then I'm moving back to trying to provide some, some motivation and leadership to the cabinet level. So we're doing some strategic planning right now. So it's, I guess the point is it is nonstop and it's constant. And it's a lot of pivoting. On one level, I absolutely love it because I enjoy allowing my mind to be challenged and grow in different ways. At the same time, you know, I want to be the leader that is putting students first. And, not, and you know, I want to say this to not just students, but also the employees. Because, you know, I think, you, you know, sometimes we, we fall into this trap that if you're student-centered and you're employee-centered, that those things are on the opposite ends and I think they can actually be the end. You can be student centered and employee centered. So I'm trying to be better about what that looks like too in terms of supporting our employees, especially coming out of the pandemic. And I think the pandemic taught us that as well. So it's like I said, it's a very different role than I've ever been in where like I feel like I've been on this very linear path from counselor to director to associate dean to dean, the vice president, and there was some substantial overlap between the positions to now being thrusted into this role, which is so different than anything I've ever done or dealt with. And with all that that you do in the day, how do you manage your work-life balance? I believe you're still teaching. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> how I'm do you still... fit that into your day? <laughs> um, it is a lot. I, I still teach at USC and, and I actually um, teach a community college leadership course and then I teach in the counseling program as well. Um, 
Well, one is because they've allowed me to continue to teach my class online. That's really the short okay. answer of what's allowed me to still teach because mm -hmm. I'm not driving to USC, right? Okay. But I teach because, again, it keeps me connected to the classroom. Right. Um, I'll give you a short story. We were making some very big decisions, right, during the pandemic and around as we were moving from face-to-face um, -to, -face to online classes. And we were sitting in cabinet and you know, the faculty wanted it to look a certain way. The executive cabinet was kind of coalescing in a different direction. And I kind of raised my hand. I was still vice president at the time, but I was like, you know, I can tell you as the only person who's teaching right now, because I was literally the only person I, and I was only doing it with one class, let alone all the classes a full-time faculty teach. I was like, it's a lot of work to migrate your class from face to face. And I said, I teach one class. And I just spent like eight hours on a weekend doing it. And so like I do it because it keeps me, going back to that, keeps me current and connected to the student experience, the teacher experience. That's why I'm not giving a class up because I want to, even though it's different populations, teaching grad students versus community college students, it still keeps me connected to the dynamics of the classroom, the issues that are happening in the classroom. And so um, I still teach. I think, you know, work-life balance is what I tell myself. And I'm always very honest with folks is, you know, it doesn't exist really <laughs> when you're a president. Mm -hmm. Because when you assume these roles, it's a lifestyle. You know, my job and my personal life lead together at this point. And I'm okay with that. Um, my daughter graduated with her master's last year. She moved to San Diego. So I'm at a stage in my life where I don't have the guilt of I'm not going home to someone and she's there by herself and she's eating dinner alone. Or, you know, I don't, I don't right. have that. I'm not at that stage anymore in my life. But what I do say is I do believe in self-care. I do believe in self-compassion. And so I just have to have strong self-awareness. So I do what I, what I call micro moments of self-care. So I go do yoga every Saturday. I mean, every Saturday and Sunday on the bluff here in Long Beach. And that's mm -hmm. part of my self-care regimen. Um, I, can, I can carve out an hour you know, on Saturday and Sunday to do that. I um, plan a lot of trips. So you know, I'm going to take a vacation commencements June 9th. Well, on June 11th, I'm hopping on a plane and I'm going to go to a vacation, right? So I'm being very thoughtful about how to leverage my vacation time and some of these micro moments. But, you know, there are moments where you are, it is imbalanced. And I, I just, I would be lying to you all if I would say it, it doesn't look like that because it does, especially right now, like at the end of the school year, it's not, it's, it's nonstop until June 9th for me at this point. Right, right. Wow. Well, thank you for sharing that. I do have some questions that came in through the Q&A. What are some of the skills uh, students and alums need to be sure they have if they want to be a leader in higher education? Um, so some of the skills that I really value when I'm looking for leaders um, to join our team. So I think you need to be an effective communicator and, and not in just one modality. Like some people think, well, I'm a really good communicator because I'm, I'm a good talker. No, I mean like all the modalities of communication. You have to be effective speaker. You have to be able to um, send out effective written communications to folks. You also, um, when you think about being a communicator beyond like the written and the verbal, you also need to connect with people. Um, I'm a big believer as a, um, that um, in using hope language. You know, I would be very frustrated sometimes when I would have leaders on my team that would frame things very negatively or they would not be aware of the words they were using. And people, you know, people need to be inspired. People need to feel like you're bringing light into the room. And so I think it's important that as a, in addition to being an effective communicator that you use hope language and that you are a hope leader. Um, and that's very important. So I see those things tied. I look for empathy. You know, are you, are you going to really try to understand the experiences of our students and the people that we work with and, and, and bring that into the decision-making process? Um, another thing that I really value is um, equity-mindedness. You know, um, I think this is a pivotal moment in higher ed. And if we do not hire leaders who are equity-minded in their practices, and in their and in their leadership, um, I don't think we're going to hit the outcomes we need. In fact, we're, we just hired forty tenure track faculty this semester for next year, and all the interviews I sat through, you know, for me, I heard a lot of great, you know, content. But I'm really listening to like 
you understand our students? How are you addressing some of these challenges they're experiencing? Um, are your practices equity minded? You know, are you using equitable grading practices? Are you, um, you know, engaging strategies that we know create a sense of validation and affirmation in the classroom for all students, particularly our students of color? And so I think, you know, those are the things that I value. And then the last thing I would say about leadership that's really, really important, and I didn't really understand this until I moved into the VP role, is I think middle management, there's a difference between management and leadership. And we have treated the word management like it's a dirty word. Like you see, we've all seen the, the graphics of this is a leader and this is a manager. Mm -hmm. You need both. Because the reality is I've seen some leaders not manage their areas very effectively. And when you don't manage your areas, that creates environments that sometimes can become toxic. Work environments, the morale can drop, the productivity drops. So it can't just be all you know, warm and fuzzy speeches. There has to be a, like, that's why I so said we have to move away from this polarity and be like, it's all about leadership and not about management. You also have to be willing to manage your areas. And I think so it's both. And again, I don't mean being a micromanager. I'm not advocating for that. But I do, I, I have seen issues where I would, I've sat down with, you know, mid-level leaders and I'll say, hey, what's going on? I'm looking at the outcomes or, you know, these numbers don't look well. You know, my team's just not really buying into some of these things. And I'm like, well, that's, that's part of the, the job as, an, as a dean or as a vice president is you have to lead, but you also have to manage your areas. And so I think, there needs to be a balance between both. And so, um, and I know that sometimes that makes people uncomfortable because of this narrative that management is not what we should be doing, but it is part of our roles. If you read job descriptions of these leaders, you know, you have to be able to manage your area as well. And so I look for the leader that can do both, that can inspire people, that can create that inclusive, supportive and affirming environment, but that also is looking at the outcomes of their area because ultimately, if our areas are not well managed, who suffers? The students. Students. The students suffer when there's a three hour line outside the door, you know? Right. And so we have to be able to do both. And so those are kind of the things that I pay attention to. Wonderful. Um, what motivates you as a leader? A um, couple things. Um, I think for one right now in this new role, what's really motivating me is to be able to remove barriers for students. Um, I'm in this unique role and I'm incredibly blessed that I can pretty much pick up a phone and clear any barrier for a student in a relatively short amount of time. I'll give you a case in point. I had a student the other day that three years ago, he was, um, and he shared this, I'm not gonna obviously say the student's name, but he had shared this in a public space that he was dealing with drug addiction and mental health issues. And now he's about to go participate in this amazing program at NASA. And it was like, I mean, he, but he needed, we needed to raise him some money to be able to do this. And I was able to pick up a phone and call a couple donors and like, boom, this young kid is now gonna head to France, right? And he's gonna do this and have this amazing impact. And I just think like, wow, you know, I guess- This is why I'm here to yeah, hear, like, hear I can stories hear, like that. Yeah. Hear all of these, you know, or, when we opened up our parking structure for our in-house students or, you know, mm -hmm. being able to enter into this new partnership that we're hoping to enter in that's going to provide some transitional housing for students with dependents because currently all the housing options we have right now are only for single students, students with no children or dependents. So, you know, I just feel like completely blessed to be able to be in a role where I can really accelerate removal of barriers for individual students, but also in a structural way. And so... I think that motivates me. The other thing that motivates me um, is really the people I work with. You know, if Long Beach City College is a really special place and I've worked in a few colleges and I told you as well as K-12, I've never worked anywhere like Long Beach City College. People really love this college. They love this community. They love our students and they show up bringing their all every day. So I wanna, I wanna do better for them. Like I want people to feel good about the place they work. I want them to feel um, like their cups are being filled here. And so, and you know, that ebbs and flows over the years, right? Like sometimes I worked in spaces where I didn't feel like my cup was very full, but you know, the great thing about it, when that cup runs low is there's opportunities to refill it, right? 
And so being conscious about how are we trying to refill the cup for some of our employees too. So I think those are the two big motivators for me right now. And then the last would be the community. I've really been enjoying the community work. Um, everyone always makes fun of me. They're like, you're everywhere. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, and I'm loving it. Like I love going to, you know, different LGBTQ community events or different rotary events. You know, I went to, I actually got really choked up. I went um, last week to um, these awards for seniors, outstanding mm -hmm. seniors in the city of Long Beach. And, you know, I think, you know, someone who has an age, who has aging parents, right. um, I really identified sitting in that audience and listening to the seniors and the impact that the senior, uh, the lifelong learning program has in their lives as they're, you know, because many of them feel isolated. It just, it just really made me realize like, wow, like, I don't even know if we're doing enough for our seniors. Right. And so it just, I had, like I said, whether it's the community or our employees or students, these are the things that are kind of like really motivating me right now. Right. And I think when we think about City College, we think about the two year transfer, but you're more than that. You're that, you know, trades, which is so important that we sometimes forget to talk about. And it is so important in all of our communities and that impact that you're having in, in, in the city of Long Beach as well. Um. You know, with COVID, um, what are the biggest um, challenges or adjustments you see that uh, Long Beach City um, will probably keep in place moving forward? So I think one was the resources, right? Like we really, I think, got it right during the pandemic in terms of scaling resources that we were just be we were just slow to scale, like our emergency student aid application. Mm -hmm. Um, like our Chromebook and hotspot um, distribution operations, um, like our free transportation for all students, regardless of whether you're full-time, regardless of whether you're credit or non-credit. And so, you know, there's, so I think there was a scaling of resources that I think we need to still continue to commit to. I think some of the other challenges is going to be is, you know, there's a lot of conversation around what is the right ratio of face-to-face and online courses. And I think one of the things that I struggle with, with the data is that, you know, students in the online courses, they struggle a little more. They don't, especially the um, asynchronous courses, the success rates and the persistent rates um, are lower. And so the tension, right, between the demand for more online, but then also knowing that, what does that mean to our success rates? That requires conversation and, and problem solving. So there's some great opportunities there, but we have to work through that. And then I think the other thing that the pandemic has done is I think it's just made us all really tired. You know, it's, it's I, I don't know about you, but I'm, I, I joke around, I say like my, you know, BC, before Corona, Mike, was a very <laughs> different Mike. You know, I was go, 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 high energy, bring it on. And, you know, now I'm just like, sometimes I'm a little bit like, I need to take a step back. I'm feeling a little overwhelmed. You know, and I think I'm not like, when is I'm, this going to be over? Yep. And I don't think I'm unique. Like, I think a lot of us like have been through a lot the last couple of years. Right. And, you know, and so we still have this heart where we want to continue to serve our students and continue to serve our community. But there's also been a personal toll. I think that all of us have experienced as a result of the pandemic. So, you know, again, how do we keep faculty and staff employees feeling supported and, and you know, re-energized? In a time where I think a lot of people feel like they're running on fumes, yeah, um, including, including our students, including our students, definitely. Um, I know we are running against time, and I know you're you have probably many meetings to get to 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 close out your day. But any final thoughts, observations, recommendations, words of wisdom that you would like to share? with our alumni and our students watching live today or the recording later? So I think first and foremost, I want folks to really believe in themselves and believe in their greatness. I think that um, sometimes um, when we make career decisions, they can, and I, and I don't wanna project on everybody, I'm, so I'm speaking from my own experiences, that sometimes you know it's easy to give in a fear-based decisions like oh you know am I ready for that next step or or oh you know I am kind of comfortable here or you know and I, and I think like all the great things that happened to me in my life 
or because I was willing to take a certain amount of risk. And I think that's really important to really feel, um, you know, to really trust yourself, believe in yourself, and to be open, right? And not just take a risk for the sake of taking a risk, but just being, allowing yourself to be open to the possibilities of, you know, aspiring for these different leadership positions. I think the other thing I would really recommend to folks to, and leave them with, apart from just, you know, really leaning into to that, is then ask yourself, you know, what does support look like for you? You know, how do you build that community of support around you? So once you kind of like identify like, yeah, this is my desire and I and you do that self-talk and like, I can do this and, and, and I deserve this, right? And the next is like, how do we make that happen, right? And part of that is you building that community of support. So whether it's those professional organizations or that board of directors that I talked, model that I talked to you about, you know, what does that community of support look like for you so that you feel uplifted to take that next step. So it doesn't feel like such a risk, right? It's within reach. So that's kind of my, 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 my two points that I would leave you with. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for spending, uh, you know, 45 minutes with us and sharing uh, your experience. If anyone would like to connect with you uh, offline, um, what, are you okay if they li link up on LinkedIn or are you- sure. I'm on LinkedIn. Yes. Yep, I'm on LinkedIn, or they can email me at Long at my Long Beach City College email as well. Whatever you know, easy, easy for you. Wonderful. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Again, uh, congratulations on a wonderful career, and we're excited to see uh, all the great things you're you're gonna do in your career. Thank you just you. got started. Uh, and please uh, visit us on our website for everyone joining us uh, to learn about future chats like this and follow us on social media. Um, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Anything else if you want to hold